Good morning and welcome to St. Christopher's Episcopal Church. I'm the Reverend Elisa Stebbing, and if you're new, so am I. This is my, <laughs> this is my second Sunday with you all, and I'm delighted to be here on the first Sunday after the Epiphany. Um, so please introduce yourself to me afterwards. Um, we're still learning names, and we will um, progress together on that adventure. <laughs> But welcome. I'm glad you are all here. It's wonderful to see you. Proclaim the greatness of our Lord God and worship him upon his holy hill, for the Lord our God is the Holy One. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord 
your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words from that prophet shall speak in my name, that the prophet shall speak in my name. I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm today is Psalm 111. In your bulletin, we'll read it together. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the right upright, in the congregation. Praise are the Jesus of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. His word is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenants. He has shown these people how power of his works, and giving them the lands of the nations. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, because they are known in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. <coughs> but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, fall. I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Presumably the four fishermen we heard about last week that he had just collected came to Capernaum where Jesus set up the home base for his ministry. And when the Sabbath arrived, Jesus entered the synagogue and began to teach. Now the way Mark words this in the Greek, he indicates that Jesus is a regular at the synagogue and that this may not have been the first time. Jesus shows up every Sabbath and teaches. Now, those that have come for worship on the Sabbath have been listening to him, and they're astounded. He teaches with authority, not like the scribes. Now, before we go bashing the scribes, we have to remember that they're trained to hand on the traditions that have been passed down through generations. That was their job. They were the poster children for, this is the way we've always done it. <laughs> but the way they had always done it was through writing and being able to read the scriptures themselves. But the folks that came to the synagogue were often unable to read or write. So they just took what was told to them for granted. What people were responding to with Jesus was hearing the interpretation of the scriptures like they'd never heard it before. And the scriptures were open to them in fresh ways, and the teaching came alive. Jesus is, after all, the living word, and that word burst into life as Jesus was explaining it to them. It's interesting that scripture is given life through the very word himself, as he's referred to in the Gospel of John. And he is reviving the hearts and minds of the listeners in the synagogue with this life-giving teaching when, just then, a man with an unclean spirit shows up. You'll notice as we go through the Gospel of Mark this year that everything in this Gospel happens immediately, now, and then, and then. It's full of action. So just then, immediately, this unclean spirit interrupts the teaching that Jesus is doing. Now, maybe some of you remember the movie Fatal Attraction. I like to think of this passage as an example of the fatal attraction these unclean spirits seem to have with Jesus. 
Why announce yourself to someone you know has the power to destroy you? Throughout the Gospels, when Jesus encounters unclean spirits, they just seem to be fatally attracted to him. Instead of running away, they seem compelled to reveal themselves, to confront him. For many of us, I think most of how we think about evil or unclean spirits is shaped by Hollywood. Heads spin around, demons seem to hide around corners in dark hallways, and their scariness is enhanced by carefully chosen background music. Jesus doesn't really deal with spirits like that. He speaks to them as one with all the authority of heaven. There's no magic or special incantations or rituals to rid the man of the unclean spirit. He rebukes it and frees the man out of the authority given him from God. That's what Jesus came for liberating God's creation from what harms, disrupting the reign of evil in this world. Jesus frees us from fear. Mark's gospel mentions that the people watching were astounded, utterly amazed. There's a connection here that is the same sort of bewilderment and wonder they had at his teachings. They were astounded at the teaching, and they were astounded at Jesus' command over evil. They heard the interpretation of the scriptures, and they saw it put into action. What they were witnessing was a demonstration of the divine powers of heaven at work, the authority that Jesus was given over evil and good. In the Gospel of Mark, we're going to hear a lot about Jesus liberating God's beloved people from the forces of evil at work in the world. To everyone in that synagogue, this man was deemed unclean. Who knows how long this man had suffered or what he had suffered? But it doesn't appear that anyone had noticed this man was even there until the spirit controlling this man decided to speak to Jesus. And what I think is more astounding than even Jesus' power over the voice of evil is how Jesus saw the sacredness of this person. This person on the outskirts of those worshiping in the synagogue. How he saw a human person created in the image of God. Jesus saw past the demon and noticed a man who had been suffering from what was possessing him. He noticed a man no one else seemed to have bothered with, and he cared enough to stop his teaching right in the middle of it and tend to the soul and body of this man. As it is with evil, this demon tried to belittle Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, the Nazarene. That was not a compliment. <laughs> Nothing good comes from Nazareth, remember? Evil also expresses itself in the form of fear. Have you come to destroy us? The outburst ends with trying to out Jesus as the Holy One of God in the middle of the synagogue, knowing that was going to rile up the scribes. Which, of course, it does. <laughs> and a seed is planted that Jesus is a threat to the status quo. Mm -hmm. That threat and that fear will grow, a line in the story that we will be following in Mark for a while, all the way to the cross. It's important for us to reflect on how all this transpires in a house of worship. Jesus is opening up the scriptures to them in ways they have never heard it before. But still they miss those in their very midst who were in direct need of those healing words. Like the scribes, 
We can get caught up in the way we've always done things. Like the folks there to worship, we can overlook those in our midst who need our care. I'm sure this guy possessed by a demon was pretty annoying at best. <laughs> Probably not someone we may at first think we want in our house of worship. But Jesus saw past the possession and saw the image of God, the sacredness of the person God had created. We too can carry our own demons. We too can become possessed by fear or take on the collective energy of a crowd and get drawn into a frenzy. Evil clouds our perception of God's presence in the world and the work of the Holy Spirit among us. Evil tricks us into being afraid of each other, of being afraid of others not like us. We are constantly being fed a laundry list of things we should fear. Jesus came to free us from that. I like to think that the church is more like a hospital, a place where people come and find healing, to be astounded at the teachings of Jesus Christ, and to be restored and made whole. After all, that's why most of us come, isn't it? We're hoping for that. We're seeking the active, living, loving, and healing Word of God and hoping we find a community that can be with us as we are restored to wholeness in God, as we are being set free. Perhaps we too can be amazed and astounded as the scriptures come alive for us as the Holy Spirit opens us to greater and deeper understanding of the living word. And from the depth of our gratitude, we will gather around the table together to receive Christ and give thanks. That may mean that the flow of things sometimes gets interrupted, like this man interrupted Jesus in the synagogue. But Jesus tends to the present need to restore a soul. That soul may be a stranger's among us, or it may be our own soul. But opening ourselves to this astonishing message that Jesus brings can open us to more and more amazement at the wonders that God can work among us. Let's pay attention to that. Look for the Holy Spirit's presence and come alive in astonishment as we seek and serve our God. Amen. Amen. Sure and certain hope the resurrection, let us proclaim our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God. Light for light, true God for true God, begotten of me, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, on the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father as the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and, and for those who are alone. alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For, for all, all who work for justice, justice freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the, for the victims of hunger, hunger fear, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Andy, Kay, Jeff, and Hector, our bishops, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all, for all who serve God in the Church. <coughs> For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We thank you, Lord, God. We pray for all those who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. you. Let us pray. Grant, O oh God, that the holy and life giving spirit may so move every human heart that barriers be twice as they crumble, suspicions disappear, and anger cease, that our traditions being healed. All people may live in justice and peace. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess the forgiveness and issue of our burden. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
Welcome to St. Christopher's Episcopal Church. I'm happy to be with you this morning. Before I forget, I want to say something for the visitors. Um, you are welcome at this table to receive communion. Um, we'll, you can either take the wafer and dip it in the wine, which we a fancy word for that is called intinct, <laughs> or you may drink straight out of the cup. If you would prefer not to receive but would like a blessing, just come up and cross your arms over your chest and we'll give you a blessing. And of course, if you'd rather not do either, you're welcome to stay in the pew. No one's gonna judge. Um, we still need winter help for the unsheltered. Is that? At this point, uh, we don't have one scheduled. Okay, we don't have one scheduled, so just keep it in mind. Um, we have two meet and greet sessions coming up. And the first one, is Tuesday night, right, Kathy? Yes. Okay. <laughs> she was there a second ago, I swear. Um, and, and But I think the time, she is planning on 6.30. And I think there may be, oh, there she is. Um, 6.30, right, Kathy? And do we have a couple more slots open? We do. So if you would like, I would, it's my way of getting to know you and to find out what's important to you. And the two questions will be, what brought you to St. Christopher's and why do you stay? <laughs> so we'll be talking about that. We're keeping them small, intimate groups. And um, so it'll be like 6.30 to 8 and um, at Kathy and Chuck Klein's. And I think you had something else to say as well. I'm seeing members of the outreach committee after the service for about three minutes. That's all I need. Just stay right here. Okay, she didn't hear that. Outreach committee, just stay in here for three three minutes. It won't be more than that. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the second meet and greet is going to, to be at the Stevens's. And I believe we've moved that to February 19th, right? Okay. So um, contact them or contact the office if you would like to come to that. And I hope you will. I would love to get to know all of you. <laughs> and... Um, and, and what is important to you. We're going to have a Lenten series um, called The Way of Love. It's Bishop Curry's curriculum that he's put together over his tenure as a presiding bishop. And it will be a potluck, and we'll start that on February 21st. Okay? There will also be a children's program simultaneously, so bring families come. There will be something for your kids as well, and you can contact Lissa for that. My installation service is February 15th at 6.30 here. Just take a deep breath for that week, okay? Because it's the day after Ash Wednesday. <laughs> so it will be a penitent and celebratory week. <laughs> we'll just be on the yo-yo for that. Um, and then, shortly following that, Bishop Ryan's... Um, annual visit will be March 24th, which is, is Palm Sunday, but we'll be having um, anyone that would like to be received into the Episcopal Church, would like to be confirmed, both adults and children, please let us know because we will be offering classes for that. So um, children and youth, let Lissa know, and um, adults, please let me or the office know so we can um, gear up for that. And Lisa, I think you had an announcement to make. Yes. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to do a new procedure. All the parents, just bring your kids into church, and we will success out during the glory. This way, everybody will have their seat, know where the parents are, want to look for them, and then we'll come back and join them in peace. So another way that kids can be part of our service is now we open, and everybody should be able to do that. So, thank you. I'll send out emails. It's starting next Sunday, right? Starting next Sunday, yes. Okay. Vicki, you had an announcement? Just a reminder that the celebration of life for Todd Shepard will be this Saturday at noon. Are there any other announcements? Yes, Larry. Uh, we're going to have a slow Tuesday pancake dinner. Yay. Starting at 6.30 in the very fall on the church dinner. You're, you're getting a theme here, right? <laughs> All right, thank you, Larry. Anyone else? All right, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as a sacrifice for us.
The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. 
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let's pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his holy love. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break and all things can be mended. Not with time as they say, but with intention. So go. Love intentionally, extravagantly, and unconditionally. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is you. And I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.